Hello and welcome to Access TV. My name is Jack Duxbury and this is... Christian Madden. Thanks for coming, Christian. You've had a torrid journey. Nothing, really. Yeah, nothing It's really. always that. It's always that. We've it's got nice. Steve in the back from Yamaha and we've got Oz behind the camera. And thanks, Steve, for setting this up. We're going to talk about keyboards and the role they've played in your life, especially currently. Yep. And who you're out on. on the, at the moment, I understand you're out on the road with Liam Gallagher, right? I am. How, let's talk about that. How did that come about and how many years has that been in your life? It's been six years and it came about through a preposterous sort of um, group of circumstances. I had a studio where I used to store all my old gear. So I had a Hammond, a Rhodes, a Wurlitzer, a Clavinet, loads of synths and a play at reverb. And I moved over the hill, like I was telling you, and I needed somewhere to put all my stuff. And um, and I couldn't figure anywhere out. And then I went to this local studio that's like a theatre and I said, can I leave this stuff in here? You can use the reverb if you want. Put the Hammond in the studio. Enjoy. So I left it in there for ages. Yeah. And then one day, do you know Joe Clegg? Yes, I do, yeah. Joe Clegg was in there and he phoned me up and I'd not seen him since he was a teenager. And he said, he just went in there. He said, who's is this stuff? And they said, it's Christian Madden's. And he said, all right. So he sent me a message and said, I've just seen your stuff. I didn't know you were in Clitheroe. We should have a brew sometime. And I said, great, we should do that. And then an hour later, Dan McDougall sent him a message saying, do you know any keyboard players? We need one for this Liam thing. And he was like, I do. Yes, Christian Madden. So I was just fresh in Joe's head. Yeah. Because I'd left my stuff in there. And then they asked for my email address and I gave them like a, a web email address. So they had a look at my website and saw the stuff that I'd done before. And I'd been playing with a guy called Simon Aldred from Cherry Ghost. He's a great singer-songwriter. And he'd been writing a couple of songs for Liam. So then the minute Liam and Debbie saw that, they thought, ah, this feels right. And they asked Simon about me and he vouched for me. So, so it's just like... And how did you feel about it? When that, when that came up, when Joe went, you know, what was it? You know, like... He said, oh, I've got a job. Somebody's asked me about a job and um, it's like... I don't know. I, I can't really say anything. I was like, go on, say something. Who is it? And he said, it's Liam Gallagher. And actually, somebody had mentioned it a few months before that, a guy called Matt Steele from Manchester. He's a brilliant player. He plays with the brand new Evies. And he went for those auditions. And at the end of his audition, he went up to Kojo and said, you should get Christian Madden on this. And obviously, Kojo <laughs> flatly ignored yeah. it. But, um, you know, so, uh, so that was the second time I'd heard about this job. And it was at a stage where I had nothing in the diary that year and I was like I actually need this so <laughs> it, it had to happen and Otherwise, then you went down and what was yeah. it what was it like in the room when you first going through the songs did you have to learn all the songs beforehand or was it more like get together well, I thought I'm gonna learn these properly and then I listened to them and I thought I, I, I can't hear what I'm actually gonna do yeah. you know it's like rock and roll star and you know there was loads of them out and none of them had any keyboards on and then I was just thinking this is going to be a tough year. You yeah, know? Who, what, what, and what do you, what have you found of, I thought that as well with the music when listening to it, it doesn't strike you as, and this is so often the case with piano, yeah. right? It's where you're like, where do you fit in? And where do you feel, um, what does he want from you to fit in? in well, as to, uh, at the start, there was a few people uh, told me, you, you know, keep your head down, keep out of his way, don't piss him off with keyboard sounds. <laughs> and as time's gone on, and I've talked to him more about it, he's just like, he's into it and he likes it and he just, and I've said, oh, I don't play. For a bit, I wasn't playing on any of the Definitely Maybe stuff. And then Liam was just like, why are you not playing on that stuff? And he's like, just get on it. And then he'll be like, you know, tells me to do weird stuff on a synth on some of them. And like, you do some mad shit on that. So I'm like, That's yeah, great. Or, you know, and I, I play organ on stuff and I play Mellotron on stuff. And the thing is, is it's not my responsibility to make it work. It's like, if it's shit, somebody out front can turn it down. Yeah. I can just yeah. sit there and I'm listening to a gig that sounds like King Crimson in my headphones. You know, it's like, I'm enjoying myself. And I say to the other people in the band, like, you should get my mix. Or, you know, you get, you get on it. There's all sorts of shit going on in here. I'll offer you my and mix. Then, and then, I, yeah, sometimes I see a video of it and I'm like, oh, <laughs> not really there, am I? But, you know. That's Don't a, think about it. Well, so so you met you met him in terms of rig wise. This is part of it, right? The YCA. Just idea? yeah. So I've been using a Kronos for years, and I mean, you, you know, great should we, keyboard. Should we offload our, like offload our gear talk? Yeah, about the Kronos because my problem was turning it on. Right, ninety seconds is is no good in a crisis. Um, you know. 
come at us, Chronos cr- yeah. <laughs> users. For me, and no, I- it's a great keyboard, uh, but I'm not. I'm not the guy to control one of those things. And like, we'd be in a rehearsal room, and somebody would say, you know, that'd be great with just a bit of compression on, or that'd be great with a slap back on it, and be like. Yeah, 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 it would. <laughs> and then I'm there, there, and it's like, where's my readers? And I'm like going through these menus, and then I'm looking for instructions. And it's just, it's not intuitive to my mind, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm a simple soul. And so I got this the other week, and it's, it's just knobs and switches, and I can handle it, you know. And it sits amongst, you've got other bits of gear on stage as well, I right? have, yeah, yeah. I've got a, an XK5 Hammond, um, and I've got a Mellotron M4. 1000D, the new one. I've got a Moog Grandmother on top of that. It's a bit spenny, isn't it? Sorry, the, um, the Mellotron. I know we're talking about it. This deer, that was the first piece of kit I got, though, where it was like, because at one point I was thinking, am I going to just be on a M Audio keyboard in a, in a wooden box, like <laughs> pretending? Yeah. And then I thought, you know, if I buy one thing, if I get this Mellotron, I think Liam will think it looks Is it the cool. wooden one that brings... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But it's and like digital. the minute I got it, he, he was like, oh, that looks cool. And then he was thinking of things for me to do on it. Whereas if I'd have been just sat there with a laptop, you know, it would just be like... I've played it, it and I, I can remember lovely. being sceptical. And then when I played it, I went, oh, I don't know if I'm being sold by the yeah. wood, but it does sound dry. And Mike, the guitarist, talked me into it because he was like, you know, just do if it. you just sat there on a laptop, it'll be suspicious of everything that comes out of it. And if, you know... And as we all are, I hate seeing somebody on a fucking laptop at a gig, you know? Even though I know all these things are just laptops, are they? <laughs> you know? Have you ever tried it? Um, but You're laptop in. I have. Yeah. I mean, I still use one. I still use one for some of the sounds on the Liam gig. And it's, I used to play with Jimmy Goodwin from Doves uh, about 2014. And he bought me a PC on that. And it's, it's, uh, it's Windows 7. Nothing's been updated on it. Just turn off everything you don't use and just leave it there and it's never gone wrong. And I turn up and people, all these Mac users are like, are you going to be all right with that? (laughs) And they go through about six Macs while I'm just still on this one PC and it just never goes wrong. And I've got software running on it called uh, Forte by Brainspawn and I thought, I'll look if there's any updates for that and they've gone out of business. So it's like, (laughs) it's just everything on it is totally gone. Why you run the gamut of gear. And coming back to this again. Well, people say, like, what are you going to do if that fails? And I'm like, well, I, I, I'll play something else. I'll just, <laughs> you know, if the piano goes down, I'll, I'll turn around and play organ. It's, nobody's going to die, are they? It's going to be fine. No. You know. No, I, I, I'm, I'm a big, I moved away from I tried the laptop thing myself and I moved away from it. Um, it's a bit depressing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know. It's more the looks from the crew, yeah. you know, like, because if it does go wrong, they're like, I, I told you I think as so. well, I think for an audience, it puts everybody in the audience in a suspicious frame of mind. But the minute they see one laptop up there, they just <gasps> think everything's bullshit, yeah. you know. And we all do. Yeah. And more than often, you know, we're right. Exactly. It is, it, and it it's is, so... It is generally bullshit. Like, most people are actually cheating. <laughs> yeah, especially with a back... Uh, is there much on the backing track do you have to run that stuff or how many people what's the lineup in there's the a bit there's a bit um so now um so we we started with two guitars keyboards bass drums um then bone had started playing more and more with us um so then um, last year bone had started doing the f- full set and then he ended up having to take a year out because of illness and then we got little barry in on guitar do you know him he came in to stand in for bonehead's parts which uh, uh, like it's like he's ended up just doing whatever he wants over the whole gig, and it's it's really it's it's great, you know. Um, and the folk, but they're, they're all they're all great. All all three of them are ex- exceptional musicians, and they're they're like, I think Mike and Jay have, have really like they they've passed between them, um, you know, the various parts from Oasis and split up the solos and all that. And then when Barry came in, the two of them just said, "Do whatever you like over it," you know. Um, but he's that kind of, he's a character player. You get some people who are session musicians who are like, I'll come in and nail whatever it is and I'll do it exactly as it is. And some people are just, you know, there's Swiss Army knives and there's hammers. Yeah. And he's a bloody good hammer. Yeah. <laughs> when he came in, was it, because I've heard so many things about his playing, about yeah, how, yeah. Uh, how special it is. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, he's just, he's steeped in, in roots playing, you know, and he's like, He's a good DJ on the bus as well, Barry. He's like, his music tastes impeccable and he's got great feel and he cares about all the right things. 
refuses to use in-ears, um, hardly has any pedals, you know, it's just uncompromising, but brilliant. Yeah, it's great. And do you feel like li Liam and the whole crew fosters that you can really go after what you need? It doesn't yeah. seem like you're getting bullied into no, we've got We've got three work. backing singers now as well, and uh, they're absolutely fantastic. And the confidence they have given Liam as well of just like, I'm not the only one out there singing, you know, it's yeah. like... Um, and then we've had we, we had... we had brass at one point, but it never... Because nobody really thought about what they wanted it for, just... <laughs> Let's have some. Yeah, like head, so they headline in a festival, people are like, oh, should we get bronze? Yeah, but it's like, um, you know, unless it's really thought out, it's like, it's a bit, it's a bit of a shame, isn't it, if it's mm. just another power chord on, on, on that stuff. So it's like, but they were brilliant, you know. We've had, the, the, the level of musicians that I've got to play with on this thing has, has constantly astounded me, you know. Drew's amazing. Do you know Drew on bass? He's, uh, he used to play with Baby Shambles. Um, and he's absolutely fantastic. And, um, Dan is incredible, Dan McDougall, who's he's out on injury at the moment, but um he uh he played everything on the first album. He's mm. uh you know, he's he's on guitar, bass, keyboards, drums, and he, he could have done the job on any of them, but I think he, he likes drumming. <laughs> so yeah. he went for that. Yeah, get uh, well And then at him. the moment Adam Faulkner's standing in for him. Um and he's absolutely unbelievable. And he's just come in and just learned the set exactly as Dan did it. He's like, not trying to rock the boat, not trying to steal the job. He's just, and he, you, you know, I'm sure he could steal a lot of jobs really, but he's just come in and just, he's written it out and nailed it. He's, he's top, you know, so. Brilliant. What, what's the, when you're playing in the gig, in the set, what's the most full on number for you, keyboard wise? Um, Is there one where you're like, this, all right, come on. <laughs> There's a, there's a couple, uh, there was one I, I did on his second album, there was one called Halo that was like a kind of rock and roll piano kind of Jerry Lee Lewis kind of thing. That was always, it used, used to be the first thing when I walked out and so that was like, and it was always strobe lights going off and so, you know, like at start when strobe lights on and you haven't even sat down and I'm like, am I playing weird? So I had that. And then the, on, on the last album, there's stuff like, um, this come on you know which is one of liam's own tunes and that's got that's one of them where um i seem to be playing at every keyboard on it and there's a few samples and a um, bit of synth and any i like playing analog synths on stage but every time you go to it it's a bit of a bit of a lottery in it it's like what's 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 it gonna do yeah exactly <laughs> so it's good fun and what are you getting out of this then so you got the, the so I've only had it like a couple of months. I've been using it, I mean, straight away, I'm really into having a good upright piano to hand mm. and then just whacking some compression on it and, and just having a massive sort of Beatlesy piano sound straight away. Well, good. That's... Now, Pat. can I... Mix penetrating. <laughs> <laughs> would you? I, I never want to ask people to play or be in. Yeah. Before, but would it be right to play it again and then I'll turn the compressor on and off so people oh, can go hear? On then, Is go that on all right? Yeah, I'll be. Yeah. A, so that's off. Better. Do you know? Just pumps a bit, doesn't it? And it's yeah. like. I don't know. Only thing is, you never know if Soundman's going to whack another one on top of that and ruin it all. I hope he don't, Sam. I hope you don't. But you know, it's uh, at least what I'm getting in my ears. Then is like, and this is as I know you've probably found. It's like sometimes it's about the games you're playing with yourself. If you can just make it sound two percent better to yourself, you might play ten percent better or relax a bit more or whatever. I certainly know that's the games you're playing with yourself with uh, Ammon sounds a lot of the time. It's like, you know. Just yeah. getting these slightly better Leslie sounds and then you listen to a video afterwards and you're just buried in the mix anyway. But, <laughs> but you were enjoying it. You know? And they secretly put you in mono. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a new update on this. I hear. Yeah, yeah. Steve's been telling me, car. Well, do, do you want to check some of it out? There's three yeah, big go headlines. Go on, we've give me the headlines. New, well, we've got a new Leslie sim. You were yeah. just talking about that. Yeah, and yeah. then there's a felt piano and then a new Hamburg. Hamburg. Which I don't know what that'll be. I'm, I'm awful it? at They can never call Who's it. Who's from Hamburg? I'm not sure which one it is, really. Yeah, <laughs> Do you have any, for the kiddies out there, any go to 
draw bar settings. I mean, that's a go-to for me. I, I fuck around with them all the way through. And oh, so you're... like, I always go on free like that, but then I'll be doing that. Especially if I've got like sustained things going on. You know, if I'm, if I'm expected to sort yeah. of hold a note for ages, I just can't help but mess with it, you know. Cause it just, I don't know, I animate it. No, totally. It, it to seems to be it. two schools either like set uh, move, set presets, or always on the move. Yeah, I grew up uh, on Booker T of the MG stuff, and so I, you know, if I'm doing solely stuff, it's all all the white ones. It's like a hippo go kind of sound. Mm -hmm. Rock is always first four, you know, with some distortion. And then, you know, anything ballady, just one. The fundamental, the third one, so. Yeah. That's too woofy down, isn't it? This and then, and then I've been getting into that Al Green one as well, which is just a little bit of that Charles Hodges. Just, just a bit of, bit of snout on it. Yes, right? yeah. yeah. And uh, we've got this new Leslie Sim. Did you say, I think... So there's a couple of them, We've got there? two rotaries. Let's hear it. This is a demo for you. Right. This is Rotary A. I think, did right. I like B better? Oof, that's the one. That's the one, isn't it? That's the better one, is the B. Yeah, it's purr, isn't it? I, really nice. I think I did some back-to-backs with yeah. the red keyboards. Oh, yeah. And it did Absolutely. very favourably, yeah, yeah. Vox Continental. Yeah, yeah Vox Continental. Yeah. <laughs> On this, um, the bit I'm excited by, which I think we said before, like, this felt piano. Oh, yeah. If we go from that U1 that we had, which is all that brightness, yeah, yeah. to then get to the felt piano, and you, I think you said made a good point about it being... Oh. Um, yeah, moody, moody. Library music. It's a good choice, though, because it's not as dark as the other ones I've heard. Hamburg. What's Hamburg's Hamburg. got going on? Oh! Hamburg's nice. <laughs> it sounds like a posh Abbey Road recording or something. It does, me. it does, yeah. What does it sound like? Compared it's, it's, to, it's, um, it's, no, no, this is back to the U1. That's the U1. Hamburg. It's grand. Robust. I'll I'll, yeah, it's, I'll still stick with the uprights probably. I don't know. Yeah. Because, you know, but that's a, that, that is a nicer gram than the other one. Well done. Let's, well done for the update. Yeah, we were waxing at how amazing it is now we can actually go out with stuff that sounds... Like we're, we think that sounds nice. Yeah. There was a long time where things didn't sound nice. What was the first... What's your kind of history in terms of electronic keyboards out gigging, other than the real stuff? Well, you see, my first keyboard... Well, I had, I had like a, a Casio when I was about 11, MT220, four yellow drum pads. <laughs> and then when I decided I wanted to be a musician, I got a Hammond um, with my milk round money and I got a T500, which had a tape recorder in it and a knocker box on it and all that. And then about three months later, the guy from the shop said, actually, you want to swap this for the, this one? And he gave me an M102. So I was like 15 then and I've still got that. And uh, it's knackered like, but it's, it sounds brilliant. So I got used to that, really used to that. And then... For a few gigs, I was saying to people, you've got to pick me up with this. I didn't drive or anything, no, you know. Oh. Pick me up. <laughs> and anyway, that was got... Was it split or...? No. No? It was uncompromising. And so, like, I did a few few gigs. Uh, well, I remember one, my mate had a coal delivery round and he picked me up on the coal wagon. And I was just on the back of it holding me am and, and he was pissing down and there was no sides on it or anything. The van that was just up there where the coal bags went. And he drove me to this gig. And so, it was never going to last as a method. So I got a uh, Emu Vintage Keys that, and I remember the advert that showed all these keyboards and it was like, you used to need a truck for all these, but now they're all in, the, and it was all right. It was all right, and that was a step up from- Did that last you a while, that? I probably used that for a good 10, 15 years or something it, for different things. Mm. The Ammond on it, at first it was like, this is really good. And they were using a crossfade to do the Leslie, so you'd have a 
slow sample and a fast sample and you'd move between them and it sort of worked all right but yeah the percussion was never right you could never do any draw bar stuff you mm. could never add vibrato you never had the drive in the same way you know um and then so i ended up getting annoyed uh at some point and thinking that was a leap up the electro too and and like Every time, like, I, I got a Krumar Mojo in about 2012, and then that was just like, I, mean, I still think that's, that's amazing, actually. The Krumar ones. I've are, never played one of those. The sound of those things, I think, I think that guy, he understands. The Italian guy? Yeah, Guido, yeah. He's, he's amazing, he's amazing. And I mean, you know, people argue ad nauseum about it all mm. on the internet. I think they're all good, you know. Do you feel it's... Uh, a different game when you're playing through big sound systems. Have, have, have you found uh, a, a chap I knew once called Carl Brazil? Right. Once gave me a bit of it. He's like, Jack, when you're doing the big gigs, you're playing the PA. And what sounds oh, yeah. good for a PA? I, I quickly realised that, like, actually, doesn't matter. You, you know, you might be sat there with your Leslie next to you thinking, this is amazing. And once a guy stuck two microphones on it and put it through his PA, you might as well be sending him a stereo out of a good simulator. And in many cases, you'd be better off because sometimes you might put three or four mics on a Leslie and you're relying on somebody you often don't even know to piece together a Leslie sound for you out of these signals that you've sent them. And that's daft. You might as well send it out of a ventilator or something and just know that it's good, you know. So, And then being in stereo is a bit daft on big PAs because it's like... Especially stereo piano, actually. It's like, well, it's all like the guys over there get to hear the left hand, which isn't doing much, you know. Especially the gigs you're doing, if there's yeah. 100 metres between the speakers, it's insane. It's like, maybe there's like a, a five foot column down the middle where it's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> this is like Pink Floyd, but like everybody else is just getting a bit, you know. It's a really weird thing, stereo at big gigs. It's, you know, that's a really good something point. everyone's committed to, but the like, quality and you made the point about the ventilator that period where it felt like you had to have one to all. But I feel like the latest crop of keyboards. I I'm still not use a ventilator. Uh, I've got Armand XK5, and I don't like the sim in that. You know, and I like the playing surface. I think it. You know, I like. I like the thing, but I don't like the Leslie simulator on it. So I, I still use a ventilator. Wh which that. size keyboard you got on this one? Do you know? Seventy-three. It? The seventy-three, and that's still weighted. Yeah, Isn't it? yeah. So but it's not. Like, I mean, because these are, these are wood, aren't they? Yeah. These are these feel nicer, but you know, Gary, had, you know, he'd be pissed off with me if he had to move that around. I think he's, he's knocking on. With your, um, <laughs> into, who got you into keyboard? Was there like a, a moment? Because uh, oh, the big moment of you gonna buy a Hammond is uh, seeing Keith Emerson doing America on Sounds of the Sixties. My mum and dad played it to me, and they were like, "I think you should get one of them." I'd been into the doors before that, so I was sort of thinking about organ, and then that was like, wow, that sounds next level, I want one of them, you know. And then my dad took me to a Burnley flea market and like one, one Wednesday, and he just took me up to this stall and he said to this guy, have you got a copy of Green Onions? <laughs> and uh, the guy was like, yeah, and it was three quid, and he just gave me the album, and my dad went, right, listen to that and learn how to solo, and it's like, <laughs> that worked, you know, so. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why I thought it was a good. I, I must have gone through that phase where I was thinking of playing guitar. I think I tried it, and it, it, I look weird with him. I don't know how old him. It feels weird making a noise with a string. It's I can't get into it. But Keith, I had the same thing. I was like seeing a guy that lead piano bit. Do do you feel that you can bring? I've heard you playing as well. It's uh, often a lost art maybe recently of yeah. guys you can stand forward and just do a traditional rock organ solo yeah and um i mean there are also i don't know it, it's like th there's not much of that in the service of music as well is there because it's like there are the internet people who are like sat in the bedroom doing amazing things but just doing take after take of the same thing all day until they get the perfect mm -hmm. instagram shot and then you know and it's like it's it's completely different isn't it because the medium ends up dictating uh the way they do it so they, you know you start making music that stops people swiping in 30 seconds i always think this if you're watching um you know Hazel molina or uh, jacob collier or something and it's like 
and they're all good, but it's like, and then I think of something like um, Chameleon by Herbie Hancock, starting with starting with synth bass for like two minutes, <laughs> and maybe the drums come in after a minute, and I'm thinking Instagram just would not have it, and it'd just be like, I've heard your riff, <laughs> I've heard your riff, I'm bored of it. And so they have to do something that sounds like they've fallen down the stairs within 15 seconds, don't they? Or else they've lost it. They've lost the revenue, you yeah. know? It depresses me a bit. But, you know, times change. People do different things. And I hark back to something that is dead and gone, I think, you know? <laughs> you hark back to those original keyboards as well. Like you said, you had the full... Have you still got all those keyboards? The yeah, and... but they're bloody everywhere. That, it, my, brother, Clegg, my brother's Clegg's just about... Clegg's got a few of them, actually. He's got me roads. Freaking Clegg. But he's done it up, so I don't know what... Is he near you, though, Joe? Yeah, he's, he's in Paddyham. Well, his studio's in Paddyham. Beautiful space, I've seen the picture. Yeah, there. he's got a good space. Uh, I've left him with me Rhodes and a Korg Delta. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. that uh, that's a good one. I think he's got my SH2 as well. Um, and then my Wurlitzer uh, is in my brother's house, and he's about to move to Germany in a few weeks. So I'm going to have to yeah, put that under okay, a bed I'm or something. Taking weight aside in a fire... Out of the classic keyboards, Hammond, Rhodes, Whirly, uh, Clav. Uh, which one are you grab him for? In which order you grab? It's gonna him? have to be Hammond. I, uh, I like me clavinet, but you know, if, if I've burnt everything else and then somebody rings for a gig, <laughs> and I'm gonna have to just go out and do it on clav. I'm gonna. It's, I've I'm never had a place to. Put, when do we get to play clav anymore? You're not much. I do get to play a clav line on Liam's. On what tune? I, uh, Diamond in the Dark. Do you know that's from the last album? That's quite quite fun to play, you know. And what Bit would you play that? Would you play it on this on this bad boy or? Well, I didn't have this when we started doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for the sound, I'd have to go back and check. I think it's ZD6, which is the the guy Guido who does the um, Mojo. I think it's his plug-in version of a clavinet, which was a good one maybe ten years ago. I think there are better ones now. I think he's actually done another one that's better, you know. But they're all good now, aren't they? They're all so much better than they yeah, used to be. People, it's incredible. To think that people um, put put the mute on and stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, when have you ever played muted clavinet? Gentle Giant used it, that's about it. Um, I got one. I got a clavinet when I was 19. I was playing with Denny Lane out of Wings. And uh, I ended up having a, a late night argument with him. And he was telling me that old keyboards are shit. <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, you should have a DX7, you can do everything on that. And oh, like, come on, oh, Daddy. Was it like a, <laughs> oh, no, he was, tell, he was either telling me to get a DX7 or an M1. And, I, and then he said, I tell you what, I've got old piece of shit that you'll probably like. And I was like, oh, what? And he said, clavinet. I bet you like them, don't you? And I was like, yeah, I do. And he's like, yeah, well, you can fucking have it. And I was like, great, okay. And then <laughs> a couple of days later, we were at the studio where, where, where it was, and I, so I was just trying to gently nudge him and remind, can I, can I have that? Yeah, get that fucking old rubbish fucking clavinet for him. And I got it, and I gave him a bottle of Jack Daniels for it, so, so there'd be no hard feelings. But I got it home, and it sounded like a banjo. And I was like, <laughs> what's, what's the mute, the mute yeah. mechanism was, was fucked, and then my mate fixed it. And then since then, I've, yeah, I've used it oh. on all sorts of things. I love it. And it's rough. You know, it's like uh, totally uneven I've across the board. I've never owned one, is it? I'd love to have one. It's good. In the heat of battles are allowed. It's under my bed at the moment. <laughs> oh. So I'll have to get it out. And you talking, we spoke about Liam and you mentioned some other bands there, uh, like Cherry Ghost as well. Yeah. Uh, what's the other um, people that you think, have you ever been asked about and you went, I wish someone asked me about that. They were good. Um... Well, you know, it, like it, when you're on that sort of Manchester circuit, there weren't many people you could really wind up with. And then I never thought I'm going to land in on any of these London gigs. So it's right. like, so Cherry Ghost, I played with Cherry Ghost and I played with Jimmy from Doves and I played with Paul Eaton for a bit. And mm -hmm. so it's like, they weren't, you know, unless I'd have got in Elbow, I don't think there was much left in Manchester to do. And then you just don't get into that London circuit you don't get asked to do anything down there it's like you move here or you don't exist don't you? Mm. So, as i'm sure you found dorset probably wasn't delivering the gigs was it no and it's certainly not since i've gone back <laughs> <laughs> it's just something about being uh, do, people don't even go things. there do they do, you, do, do people even tour there or no uh, bournemouth bournemouth yeah. uh, probably the worst audience i always think that the there's this entire corner of the country that nobody can be bothered going down and playing to and it's like they must be crying out for it like what did they get? A bit in Bristol. 
bit of Bristol. Bristol. There's an odd phenomenon I find of like the bigger you get in the UK, the less you're allowed to play, which seems odd. Like, well, it's because they'll go. It's because oh, you they end up with this running cost. Man- of- Manchester or Liverpool, right? You know, like can't I do both? I, yeah, I've been talking about this a lot of late because there's a, there's a venue in Nelson next to Burnley called the Nelson Imperial Ballroom, and um, I, I had a look through uh, the listings from the like, from like 1967, and they had in a two month period they had the list of legends that they had on like Spencer Davis Group, um, Jimi Hendrix Experience, the Stax Roadshow, including Otis Redding and um, you know. Carla Thomas and um, Booker T and the MGs, all these people played in Nelson, and you wouldn't piss on Nelson if it was on fire. It's it's <laughs> it, it's a it's a sad place, and he had this venue that the Beatles played at like three times. It's so amazing that people people had to go everywhere, and like mass media kind of killed it because it was easier to go on telly than it was to drive around the country. You could reach everybody at once. And then I think what kills it now is that people know they can make more money playing less nights in bigger places. And because they have all, all the crew and the lights and the video, it's like, well, let's do three of them and then send everybody home. You know, it's, it's, uh, it is a bit tragic. But like provincial towns, all the second tier towns have been cut out and people are there. If you watch, you go and look at a comedy tour a comedian will do like 40 dates. They, they look like a tour that the Beatles were doing in the 60s, but yeah, a band won't, you know. Top bands will do two cities. Next tier down will do eight, you know. And nobody, nobody's... Real talk, people. <laughs> I wish, it, it maybe seems a bit English, UK-centric. I think maybe in other countries they're better at, like in Germany, it seems, or France, you get out into the weeds and like, where are we tonight? Do we though? Like, because... I don't know, when you go to Germany on tour, you do, um, you like do Cologne on your first tour and then you go back and you, you know, yeah, you like do, right, yeah. as soon as how you... long does it take you to get to Frankfurt? You need about five rolls of the dice before you do that. And that's like <laughs> yeah. the, the financial centre of Europe, isn't it? So yeah. it's a bit bizarre. That brings us to like, what's on the cards if anyone wants to see you play? Um, where can they see you play? With Liam over the next... Um, couple of months we've got we've got a couple of UK gigs we've got Boardmasters uh, and we've got oh we're doing a gig at Coco in London but that's well sold out so you see you can't come <laughs> <laughs> and then we go to Japan um, we've got uh, two in Tokyo one in Osaka um, and then I think we're out till next year then um, and uh, I've, I've been doing some solo stuff organ organ stuff that uh, I've got coming out soon so, um, like instrumental Booker T kind of stuff with brass and all that. And uh, got an album of that coming out in August, I think, 25th of August or something like that. That sounds great. Well, what, more about that. What's the lineup and the inspiration uh, behind it? I just wanted to make more of the music that I like listening to, you know. So, And if I, if I finish it and I like putting it on and listening to it still, then um, then it's good enough. So I've done two of them in the past and then... This third time, uh, a mate from Bristol is putting it out. He's got a small label called Friendly Records, um, and he's putting it out on green translucent vinyl. And it's got it's got some of the guys from the Liam band on it, and then a lot of my mates from up around Burnley and stuff, and some other people from the internet who I don't really know, who I just no. sort of given some cash to, you know. And it's got strings and brass and yeah, brilliant. It's good. I'm, I'm trying to get it back to getting together with my mates and playing because th- that kind of thing of, I mean, I don't do it, but it makes me sad to see young people sat in their room just playing to a camera all day, every day, hoping to get virtual reaction. And it's like, I actually got into bands to hang around in rooms with my mates and, and make a noise together. And it's not economical for young people anymore, but it's like, I'm just trying to do things where I can make that happen again. So, like, I've started just booking a studio and getting a bunch of mates in together and playing, and it's really good. It's like, it's meant to be a social activity. It's meant to be communication between people, and it's like, it's not meant to be just stood there going over and over again and then, and then doing it again the day after. 
That's tragic. <laughs> you, see, you, got, you got two little ones, two kids? Yeah, yeah. Are they, oh, I, I don't know how old they are. Have you started playing the music or trying to direct yeah, how you with Curtis them? Yeah, and Rui, they're um, 11 and Rui will be 10 on Tuesday and uh, they both play guitar and they're really good. And Curtis has got perfect pitch. Um, my wife's got perfect pitch and it seems to have gone down. Uh, her mum's got it and when grandma had it. When did you find that out in the dating process? Oh, I knew that before. Before you even... <laughs> she got perfect pitch. That's going to be good for my gene pool. Yeah. yeah no, she, uh, yeah. she doesn't show off about it. She always tries to pretend she hasn't got it, but she absolutely has, yeah. And she, she's a brilliant musician. She's like, she's a really good piano player. Um, and then with the kids, you just start, you just start noticing that they're like, that's in that key. And that, uh, yeah, Dad, oh, you're Then Curtis in... has started saying that. The shower, listen to the shower, it's in B. Yeah, stuff like that, you know, it's uh, just... So they've both gone down the guitar route so far. Yeah, well, it was kind of, uh, an, uh, yeah, an expedient thing of just like there was a guitar teacher at school and so they went along and did that. And then last year when we played at Nebworth, Curtis came back and he was just like, um, how do I, how do I become a musician? And I was like, well, you're going to have to get obsessed with it, you know, you know how you do it you've got to listen to it all the time you've got to watch it all the time and you've got to get up first thing in the morning and watch it and last thing at night and he was just like right and he, and he just did it all summer and he just played along with the set all summer and he just learnt all the LG set by the end of the year and then he's and he's been sat there watching it while he's doing it and so he's ended up like just picking up the subtleties of watching other people playing and how they hold it and He's playing in time because he's playing along with stuff. and His pitch is bang on, so it's like, it's, you know, you sort of seep into the subconscious in loads of ways, don't you? And what was it like? You two, is it the Nebworth gig? Yeah, we did two. Um, they were... What's that like? It's like? It was a bit like playing Leeds or Reading, really. It was all the same stuff. Um, but, but it's your gig, it's a... It was... I didn't get any kind of emotional... Um, impact from it until I watched the documentary they did about it and then I was and I was like oh wow we we did that you know but at the time it, it just felt like you were doing a gig really it was you know did it did he take it in his stride having already experienced it or uh well as far as Liam's concerned I don't think he did experience it last time so okay. I, think, I think this <laughs> this time was to <laughs> yeah. let's generate some memories about Nebworth you know um but I think yeah I think he enjoyed it and he said on the first day I met him, he said, we'll, we'll do Nebworth. And I, I didn't actually, I thought, wow, this guy's really quite confident about, about this, this comeback thing. And, um, and he's, he's done it, you know, and, it, and he's he sold it out in, in minutes. And it's like, it must feel good to be there and know that that's for you. And I always have to, doing this job, I have to remember that it's, it's not me. And it's not, you know, I'm sat there, I've got a good seat. People are looking at me, but they don't see me. I'm like directly behind him, but I can walk through the crowd afterwards and nobody, you know, nobody even gives me a little, hey. Oh. <laughs> I, were you, no, nothing. Oh, I can be oh. at bar like, <laughs> can I get in? Nothing, nothing. Oh, amazing. So it's like you just, you know, it's anonymity, but then you've got the front row seat, you know. But it's, it's, it's all for him. It's definitely not for us, so, you know. Your kids tend to look, are they asking questions about it when they're there or is it just fun and they're... it's weird because i've been you know i've done so many crap gigs in my life but across the span of their life they've been coming to watch me do these <laughs> do you remind do, do you arena, go, arenas and like it's like it's not actually just like this you know it's like i mean just before i got the liam gig i was doing all sorts of things like i was doing I was doing functions with people who i'd not met and doing like three or four different sets a week i was doing one gig where i dressed up as a mouse and played for children <laughs> and i just anything uh and and then as i can remember thinking i would love to just do one thing well just that like because i was always thinking you go and watch like prince or something and you're thinking well they've got their shit together but they're not doing that they're not they're not <laughs> they're not going and playing lionel richie on saturday night either they're like they're doing that gig those long rehearsal periods yeah really make the difference you know really yeah. learning that one set yeah tiny screws but then I also do like doing stuff where nobody knows it and, and you're all... Yeah, do you think you gig your solo stuff as well? I'm going to gig it next Wednesday in, in Salford, yeah. Um, it's only a small pub gig, but it's good. Like six of us doing it, so... If people want to hear that, 
Uh, where to, do you do any internet stuff where they can I've got a you? website, christianmadden.co.uk. That'll lead to everything. I am on Instagram and Facebook, but on Instagram, I'm grilled fire. Um, I did it when I was drunk. And I, I was trying to write grilled fish. I was pissed and my eyes are bad and I put grilled fire and I, I've, I'm stuck with it now. But so, you know, some people have found it. <laughs> it it's not good branding. That's too good. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, Facebook. Grilled fire. It's really good. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> One letter on. Yeah, you got to come. Uh, when you gig it, what's the lineup going to be? Uh, so next week we're doing uh, bass, guitar, organ, drums, and uh, sax and trumpet. Well, whilst it's fresh in the memory, I know we're freaking miles away. But if you're ever down here, please I, I stop by. We'd love to. Get it out there. Do you know what? There's some amps here and that, isn't there? Yeah, we've got loads. We've got a shot oh, there. For the... You'd like them as well. They're good lads. Nathan, bass player, plays with Miles Kane. He'd be good to get in. He's good, good, good on telly. Just come to get, come play, man. We'd do it. And show be, and we can talk about it. Yeah, fantastic. Come in. Uh, thanks so much. And this, I'm sure, we'll learn more about it. We've done loads of videos about the geeky side of these keyboards. I know. And, I'm uh, watch some of them when I get it back. I'll make a proposition I'll send them to, Gary. to the punter out there as well. <laughs> At the moment, in the kind of like Venezuelan inflationary times yeah, we're yeah. in, yeah, here, yeah, yeah. this is a remarkable... Uh, uh, since yeah, it came since out... Since four grand is the new two grand, and, but this is actually two grand, which is the old one grand. I feel it's yeah, worth fact, mentioning is... like, that that's the case. At the moment, in 2023, and you want vintage piano sounds... Uh, yeah, electric piano sounds and also and you, modern... want a, you want some knobs and buttons that you can go for yeah. with 46 year old eyes and <laughs> yeah. you know you've got the colours on the draw bars and all that <laughs> and not too many holes on packs so and you it's can black just, it's black no one's going to you don't be... like other colours other yeah. colours are available but if you don't like them oh the amount of times I've turned up with the red one and people were like I ain't got a black one you know because we forget most normal people just want a black keyboard you so. do it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's good it's sturdy it's well put together isn't it um, real pleasure, mate. And thank you thank for you. sorting this out, Oz and Steve. And see you soon Cheers, on Austin's TV. Nice one.